The world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and market loss. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode and spending your most valuable resource, your time once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. We have podcasts, books, reports, webinars, and much, much more. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, The Wealth Dojo. It's the number one newsletter in the alternative wealth strategy and alternative asset investing space. You can subscribe by going to CashflowNinja.com forward slash subscribe. I've got a fantastic show for you today. Joined by Gary Young with a Royal, uh, Royalty Exchange. And we're going to talk about music royalties today. We've had a lot of interest about this, but before we jump into that really exciting topic, Gary, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you, MC. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So for our listeners and viewers that's not familiar with you, can you please share a little bit about your background and, and journey? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, so towards the end of 2015, uh, two partners and I acquired Royalty Exchange, um, the assets of that business. And um, it was, uh, we didn't really, we didn't know anything about the music business, um, but we thought it was like the most interesting thing we could be working on at the time. Um, and we were, we were drawn into it because royalties can be such an interesting alternative investment. And, um, we were like, how do we buy these royalties? And then, and then the opportunity to own the exchange where they could be traded and bought and sold, et cetera, came up and it was like, oh, we should, this is, this is even better. Like if we can, if we could become the hub where people can buy these super unique, interesting assets, that would be a really fun project to work on. And uh, eight years later, it's that we were right. So it's been very fun. So for uh, people, if this is their first time hearing music yep. royalties, how does this work? How does music royalties work? And how, how are they available for purchase? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so basically it, you could think about a music, music royalties are, it's all underpinned by federal copyright law. So the idea is if you create something as an artist, as a songwriter, as a producer, and, th and this is true for, for books, films, everything else, but basically if someone wants to consume that music or buy that music, they pay a royalty to the people responsible for creating it. And that's how that's how artists make their living. That's how songwriters definitely make their living. Um, and and the idea is it's it's kind of shifted in the last decade from a purchase to a consumption model. So say you have Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon Music, whatever it is, every time you listen to a song, a, a bunch of different people are getting a royalty. They're getting a percentage of your a very, very, very small percentage of your subscription revenue that you pay to Spotify. And so music royalties got, and this was not really like, I would be lying if I said like, we saw the future and we were like, streaming is going to be huge. And like, this is, this is a thing, but it was in the beginning of streaming getting big, you know, it'd been around for a while, but what, what happened with that and that shift was that music royalty started paying a lot over time and started to look more like an ongoing cash flow rather than an album comes out 
a bunch of people buy it, buy the CD or the vinyl or the cassette, whatever it is. And then, and then it kind of goes away. And so they went from this, like, almost like it launches, you get paid some money and then it dries up to, you get paid less upfront, right? But you get paid for the life of the copyright. And the thing about it in most countries in the world, copyrights are super long duration. So in the US, it's the life of the last surviving author plus 70 years. So once everyone uh, associated with the song has passed away, it's still going to earn royalties for another 70 years. So these are ultra long duration assets that because of streaming are suddenly paying a lot more money over time. Um, and that, and, and so, so the answer to the second part of your question, like how does this, how does this become available? So um, we have a, we have a whole team at royalty exchange that goes out and, and contacts songwriters, artists, producers, and, so it's like, are you interested in, in selling this cash flow? Um, and for some of them, they want to they want to pull that money forward to, you know, invest in their career, buy a house, uh, invest in other businesses, diversify their earnings. Because for a lot of like songwriters, especially, you know, they are in a for your for your listeners, they have a highly concentrated portfolio, right? That that it's all their wealth is in, in their music, and so one of the things we did early that was key for us was like we, we would talk to songwriters and we would say hey why don't we sell 50 percent of the royalties from one of your songs and then you could diversify and and so like you know buy some real estate w whatever it is and and that was like a big big like win for them and for us and for the people that buy the investors that buy stuff on our site because it allowed both parties to diversify Right. And, yeah. and so which is kind of how how all this stuff gets to our website. That's interesting. So musicians, by the sound of it, too, I mean, depending on their contracts and so forth, but especially when they're earnings from the music, it sounds like, you know, there's not a lot of liquidity and sometimes they need some to yep. reinvest in a new album, a tour, like yep. they have to raise capital or buy a house, buy other real estate and so forth. So it makes sense. And then for investors, I mean, talk about a really like non-correlated asset clause. Yep. If people get sad, they play music. People get happy, they play music. They want to yep. have fun. You know, they play, they work out. They, you know, they enjoy music. So it seems like the economy really doesn't really affect the amount of music that's being played. So this is a very unique and intriguing asset class for yep. people to invest in because it, it does it doesn't correlate with the financial no, market. No, it it doesn't. And and the thing too about it that I think is um you know, we already talked about how how long duration the assets are, but the uh, the thing is that streaming services are such a amazing deal it's like okay for between 9.99 and 14.99 a month you can listen to any song like 50 million songs like in your pocket whenever you want there's no lag there's and so so it's also like one of those things that it's it's like it's almost too cheap to not do it right it's like uh, like it's it's it, at least in in the Western world, right? In places where music markets are really big, I mean, it's like every so, so everyone has some music streaming service, even if it's just going on YouTube and listening to music because you get paid royalties when people listen to your song on YouTube, right? So it's it's one of those things that um, you know it's not it's not correlated to the broader economy because it's just pure consumption. And the thing, the other thing that's kind of interesting about it from an investment perspective is it's I don't want to say it's easy because there's definitely skill involved in it, but it's comprehensible. It's like, okay, this is a popular song. People have been listening to it for 10 years. They're probably going to continue to listen to it. Right. And, and the, there's a, there's this idea popularized by um, uh, Nassim Taleb. This is the Lindy effect, which is basically like for anything that is a, um, intangible and i could be getting this slightly wrong but i'm adapting it to, to my purposes but basically if 
you know, if a book's been in print for 50 years, odds are it's going to be in print for another 50. If a song's been listened to for a decade, it's probably going to be listened to for another decade, right? And so you can basically look at a, a music royalty and look at the, the underlying songs and say like, okay, these have been out for this long and they're still getting played. That, you know, as the assets age, they become more predictable, right? And and so it's like, it's not correlated. You can kind of look at it and say, okay, it's been around for a while. It's probably going to keep going. And and then figure out what, what sort of discounted cash flow you want to give it and, you know, buy it accordingly. And it could provide a, a steady stream of income, like you said, that is spread out over a very, very long period of time. Yeah. And, it, and a lot of the other things, and part of the reason why we, you know, how we got into royalty exchanges, because like we saw like, if you buy, you know, you buy a royalties from a song, uh, you're getting that passive income. And also like, there's no real expenses associated with it. Like you don't ever have to replace the roof on your hit song, you know, like you don't, it, it, you know, and so, so it becomes like most of it really does fall to the bottom line uh, in terms of passive income. Um, and certainly most of the things that we sell on the site are purely passive. So like it's, it's a song that was put out by a major record label or a major publishing company. And, and so like they're managing their portion of it and paying you the royalties. So it's, it's pretty, it's the closest thing I've ever seen to truly passive income. So here's another point that I, I just wanted to bring up too, because people might be listening to this just as I did the first time I heard of this, I was like, Wait a second. So what type of artists are selling like royalties? Because your first thing that you're thinking about is it's all, pr pr not everyone big is probably doing this. What type of artists or musicians are? Uh, and I mean, ever since that, I was shocked just to see the and I mean, I don't consider myself to be very knowledgeable about all the, <laughs> the artists and up and coming yeah. artists. But even I was, I mean, like big names and all you have to do is just look into the whole Michael Jackson royalty kind of yep. uh, situation there. And Eminem was selling off royalties. And I mean, yeah. you could go on and on with all these different artists. Um, they are all yeah. selling them, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's well, one thing that's important to know is um, it's often not the artist selling. Um, so because like, and, and this is one of the sort of interesting nuances with this. And, and it's why like our business exists is because with every song, you have a bunch of different people that participated in its creation. So you'll have, you'll have the artist, you'll have um, songwriters, you'll have producers, you'll have mixers, audio engineers, everything else. And, and for songwriters and producers, especially you know, they will own a piece of the song just like the artist does. And and so they, most of the stuff we sell on the site is owned by the artists or producers. Um, and so so it's like this thing where someone that you, you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't recognize them on the street, but like they're responsible for like some of the biggest songs of the last 25 30 40 years and you'd have no idea who they were but they own like an equal percentage of the song as the artist that made it famous right because they wrote it and, and so so like when you look at stuff especially on our site like um it's very rarely the artist and the reason is um and this kind of goes back to something you were saying earlier where like there's not much liquidity in the space now if you're a major artist you have a lot of different ways to make money. You could do sponsorships, you could go on tour, like there's all merch, all kinds of things. But if you're the songwriter that wrote those songs that people love, no one knows who you are. Maybe you have like, you know, 1200 followers on Instagram, but you own an amazing asset. And like, we help people monetize that or monetize a portion of it, right? And so that's sort of like, the, the nexus that we um, exist in where you have these songs that are massive hits, billions of streams, like everyone, like everyone has heard this song. And it's like, oh, there's a guy who wrote, who wrote the beat, 
right? And and that guy owns 10% of the song. And 10% of a massive song is very valuable. And then they come to us and they say, I want to sell some portion of my interest in it because you know I want to buy some rental properties or something, right? Um, or do some life insurance things, stuff like that. Set set themselves up and their family up for long-term prosperity. And that's kind of one of those things that that we help them do. And and at the same time, by helping them do that, then it becomes something that, you know, a, an investor from outside the music business can can participate in, which I, um which is cool. It's cool to bring these two like very different groups together and and help them transact in a way that is mutually profitable. Uh, yeah. It's very very interesting. So how does it how does this work for someone that is not familiar, they're listening to this for the first time and they're like, This sounds pretty cool. I have to go check it out. Yeah. How does it work on the platform and how does someone go about uh b- buying uh music royalties? Yeah, so um so basically uh you know it's it's royaltyexchange.com. Um we've got Probably right now, we probably got 600 different assets up on the site right now um, that could be bid on. And and the way it works is there's um, there's a listing and the listing outlines uh, all of the information we have about the catalog. Um, and you know, here are the top songs. Here's how it's making money. Um, you know, is it big on streaming? Is it playing on the radio? Is it in a movie? That that's sort of, like those sorts of questions and. And we do a write up on each catalog and we go through all of that and we look at you know how have the earnings gone over the last five years. Sometimes we have data going further back, but you know, and sometimes younger songs. There's just like it came out two years ago, so here's the last two years of data, right? Um and then we vet everything that we put on the site. So um so we do pretty extensive due diligence on it, make sure that you know um there's clear title on it like some some pretty basic stuff to make sure that like this is you know what the seller claims it to be this is these are the earnings we verify that with a third party whoever's paying the earnings we go to them we verify those earnings and and basically by the time you see it on our site it's been vetted pretty extensively and um and then you could just then you could create an account and and bid on it and and the way fundamentally the way it works is there's a listing up Sometimes the seller will set a list price and that's kind of like the buy it now price. That's the price that if you're willing to pay that price, they will sell it to you for that today. Not all assets have a buy it now price. Um, And so if there isn't one, or if you don't want to pay that much, you can basically place a bid and you say, I'm willing to pay you X for this, for this stream of income. Um, And then the seller has the option to accept, decline, or make a counter offer. And then you can go back and forth negotiating price on the site. Um, so yeah, so that's that's how it works. We tr- we've tried uh, over the last eight years to make it as you know streamlined and simple as possible. But I would definitely, you know, if you're at all interested, it's definitely would be a good idea to check out the site and just read through a dozen listings because there's so many on there right now, and you can see, you know, how how different types of music royalties work. And and we've got um uh this the ultimate guide to buying music royalties um which is uh maybe we put a link to it. It's it's free. Uh they can come to the site and download it. It's like a 55 page ebook that goes into at certain points perhaps excruciating detail on how to evaluate and understand music royalties, but um there wasn't anything like that out there. So we, we put it out and we just came out with a new edition of it. So, so it's a really good place to start. Awesome. I will, for the people listening, uh, I will put uh, a link to it. Uh, I'll just go cash uh forward slash music royalties. That'll point to that guide. So you can just go there again, cash forward slash music royalties to download the ultimate guide uh, cool. of, of buying music royalties so what happens after you've purchased it now you've said okay you've determined a price you've mm-hmm. uh funded funded it uh it's now transfer title i'm assuming over to you what what does that then look look like yeah so so basically the way the way it works is um royalty exchange 
takes possession custody of the asset on your behalf um and then you create an account with our administration program and basically then we start paying you the royalties when when we receive them um and that that allows us to one keep an eye on how the royalties are doing and then we have a, a secondary market. So once you buy something, it is autom- in most cases, it is automatically relisted on our site. So because like providing liquidity to songwriters and artists and producers is great, but also like to, to make this a, because our, our long-term vision is that intellectual property will be as liquid as a stock or bond market. Right. That's where we want to end up. And so once you buy something, it's listed again on royalty exchange. And so if you ever want to sell it, you could do it in a few clicks and exit the investment. Right. Um, And so so basically we handle the administration. We pay you the royalties as they come in. We provide you statements, everything else and, and keep an eye on it. And then if you want to sell it after you've held it for a while, you could sell it right on our site. A couple clicks. And then it's deposited monthly, uh, the royalties into your account, or is it monthly, quarterly, annually? It, it all depends on the frequency of the royalty stream. So, so some uh, royalty payors pay monthly, some pay quarterly, some pay semi-annually, and then some, there's still a few out there that pay once a year. And so basically, once we receive the money, you get paid in 30 days. Um, so it just kind of depends. And on the listing for every individual asset, we note the payment frequency. So if you wanted to only look at, you know, music royalties that pay every month, you could, you could kind of filter and sort on that and see those, or if it doesn't matter to you, then, you know, it's, it's all based on the, whenever we receive money, we pay it out. How are these, uh, royalties taxed? Ooh, yeah, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. So at the beginning of this, I should say I am not a tax professional and I cannot give tax advice. This is only something I've heard, right? Um, but uh, fundamentally, you could do one of two things generally. It's like you could either straight line amortize, amortization just being the intangible version of depreciation. Um you could either straight line it over 10 years or you could do the income forecast method where you basically uh, forecast what you think the income will be. And then that's how much amortization you get each year. So it's a pretty tax efficient setup also because, um, you know, you get to depreciate the asset over 10 years um, and, and that shields some of the royalty income year uh, from taxes. Gotcha. Got Not a tax it. professional. Talk to your talk to your accountant. But that's something that some people have done. That, perfect. Yeah. I always yeah. jokingly say uh, we're not a CPA or a tax strategist, and we don't play one on the internet, right? Yep. Nor uh, do I. How do you achieve clarity, certainty, and predictability in a world economy and markets that are volatile and chaotic? How do you have confidence in an environment where change and disruption is constant? Setting up infinite banking is how you establish certainty in an uncertain world, predictability in an unpredictable world. With an infinite banking policy, you have your capital warehoused outside of the Wall Street casino where it is guaranteed, guaranteed never to go down in value and guaranteed to grow tax-free. You have guaranteed access to your capital, and you also will be able to access your capital tax-free to use to capitalize on opportunities as you come across them. Creating your own banking system with infinite banking can be your secret weapon to protect and grow wealth during turbulent times. You can watch a presentation and explore infinite banking options for you and your family at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. So uh, I'm always interested. So what, how does this go wrong? Like, how do people, uh, uh, you know, how do people lose money in 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 a, in a asset class such as this? Yeah. Um, well, there's a few a few things. So. Um... 
the first is a, the price you pay matters, right? Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's just true across the board, right? Um, then other ways this goes wrong, it's pretty rare, but from time to time, um, someone uses someone else's work without asking permission. And there's, and there's like a, um, copyright lawsuit, um, where, you know, you think that you've bought someone's 25% interest, but it really turns out that they don't have that. Um, now we check for all this before we put it up on the site. Um, but if someone like broadly was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to go, I, I know a songwriter, I'm going to buy his royalties. I would, I would say things to watch out for, make sure that the splits on the song have been um, clearly uh, divided. Um, so this, this comes up a decent amount with younger songs where people are in the studio. Someone said, Oh, I, I own 25%. And it turns out that there was no, no paperwork to substantiate that claim. Um, so it can go wrong there, um, with, uh, other things that can go wrong is, you know, if you pay too much and it's a pretty young song, mo most of the time, like song comes out and it makes a, and if it's a, if it's a hit, it makes a ton of money in its first like two or three years. And then it declines pretty substantially. And then it kind of hits this base rate where, you know, this is, this is how much it's going to make for, for, for a long time. Right. And depending on the genre, sometimes that's like six, seven years after the song came out. Sometimes it's like 10 years after the song came out that it kind of hits this steady state where it's going to be plus or minus a couple percentage points, but it'll be pretty consistent. One of the risks is if you if you purchase um, a young song and pay a high multiple of cash flow on it, and then it declines a lot, um, then it could be something that it's like, oh, this is... I thought I, I, you know, like paying 10 times cash flow for a song that came out two years ago is, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. So they can go wrong that way. Um, you know, if you don't have clear title on the song, that can, that can be a way these things go wrong. Right. Um, we make sure that's good before we put it up on our site. But if you're, not if you don't do that like you could really run into some problems um and you got to make sure that the asset's not encumbered so tax liens divorce decrees child support payments stuff like that that um that you know you, you could buy something and then have you know uh state of california's franchise tax board come in and say actually that's our cash flow because we're paying off the person who created that song's tax lien right um, so those are those are some of the, the common ways, more common ways that these things can go wrong. Um, so, you know, if you're going to buy music royalties, not on our site, like these are the things you got to look for. And you got to make sure that like um, there's nothing like wonky in their recording agreement or producing agreement or publishing agreement, which is like, oh, they they can borrow money from the record label. And then the record label like pulls back the royalties and you're not protected if that happens. So, so it's, it's, it's a lot of it is like, it's not that different from real estate, right? Cause it, you're looking at is the, is the property is intellectual property in this case encumbered. Is there clear title like that kind of stuff? Those are the key things you got to look at. And then, and then it becomes like, how much did you pay for it? Because now, even if you paid a ton and like, Actually, another example, and yeah, we've done probably 1,800 deals. So there's like, we've learned a lot over the years um, about this. But like one, one of the things that I, I've seen some some buddies of mine that are buying stuff that's not on our site, like one of the things that can be a bit of a pitfall is like, um, you know, if if a song is used in a commercial, like an advertisement, like a lot of times, like there's very few songs that like are used in ad campaigns for decades. There are some, but not that many. And so like, if you look at a song that's like, you know, used in a target commercial and it's making 50 grand a year from target and $2,000 a year from Spotify, 
you really got to look at like what the ongoing earnings are, not the earnings that are driven by advertisements, stuff like that. Like that, those are some, some big pitfalls that I've seen over the years. In that example, one of the things that you mentioned, if somebody pays 10 times cash flow, which that was going to be one of my questions, what's like a general rule of thumb of what, and I know it's going to be different in each situation, yeah. if it's a sought after song and so forth, but maybe if you can elaborate on that, but just to finish that, that, that point on overpaying because something was in an ad, that example, $50,000 a year in an ad, 2000 on Spotify, so 52 thousand times 10 now for 520,000 all of a sudden it's not in the ad anymore <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah and you gotta you gotta watch out for that like if you think about it like and and we can kind of like abstract it out a little bit further looking at a a song or a catalog of songs right um you you want to look at like how much of the income the royalty income is recurring versus non-recurring Right. And like ads are sort of the quintessential example of non recurring. Also, like, you know, if a uh, if um, a movie uses a song, right, there's there's what's called a sync fee, which is paid up front to use that song in the movie. But that doesn't recur. So, like, if you're looking at a catalog and you're saying, OK, like, how much should I pay for this? You want to identify the stuff that is one time versus recurring and, and price it really based on the recurring income, right? Um, and then, then, yeah, the other part of your question, like what's the general rule of thumb? A decent, you know, it all varies, right? But a decent rule of thumb is if you look at the age of the earnings from the catalog and you pay a multiple somewhere around the age. So, um, a, a multiple on the recurring re royalties from the song. So if you look at a song that's 10 years old um, and it kind of goes back to that Lindy effect thing we were talking about earlier, it's like, okay, if you paid 10 times cash flow for a 10 year old song on that, that, that like that could work, obviously not investment recommendation, you know, but, but like, that's a decent starting point to think about this and and um and of course that's kind of capped right if a song is 40 years old no, no one pays 40 times right for for uh, a song right um but but yeah so so i would look at that and i i think like if we look at because we administer the the royalties that that we sell on our site like we have a ton of data on how assets have performed and and like on average the average deal purchased on our site over the last five years has made like 13 and a half percent cash on cash annually, which is a pretty good return, right? Yeah. Um, it's, there's, there's not many things in the markets broadly that get that with the level of risk that a music royalty has. Right. Um, and so, so if you look at that and, and, and think about each, each catalog you're analyzing, you know, looking at the age, looking at the sources of earnings. Like if I was, if I was going to say like, what are the three things to look at when you're trying to make a decision on how much to bid on a music royalty asset? And this is true, like on our side, if you're going to do it out in the wild, whatever, right. I, I would say you want to look at how old the songs are. Older is better. Right. Um, Second thing is you want to look at the sources of earnings. And so, for example, um, if a song is a massive hit on the radio, it will make songs will make a crazy amount of money, even today, for like terrestrial FM radio. Like they will make crazy amounts of money. Crazy amounts. Like it's wild. But then once that song goes out of rotation on all of the top 40 radio stations in the country, those royalties are gonna drop a lot. And so if you look like the the ideal like high value asset on our site is something that is 10 plus years old that makes most of its money from streaming. Um and you know that like the combination of those two things like you you can investors have paid a lot and done well for assets like that. As soon as it starts to get different, like if the earnings, if there's a lot of non-recurring earnings, like then you have to kind of look at those and 
probably reduce the multiple on that stream of income, right? So if you see something that's like 50-50, if 10-year-old song, 50% of the income is non-recurring, 50% is recurring, then paying 10 times for the recurring and two or three times for the non-recurring could make sense and they get you to some some blended multiple. And that's the way I would think about it. Um, you know, and, and then and then there's like some some songs that are just iconic evergreen songs that will get used. Like if you imagine like if you're looking at a, a song and you're like, oh, this has been used in like 15 movies. Well, then some of that non-recurring revenue may come back because like songs like songs that you listen to on streaming services that are used in movies are used to like evoke a period of time or a mood. Right. And so yep. that is a pretty common period of time that movies are made about, um, you know, then you might get a lot more TV and film placements, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, but but I mean, to sort of sum it up, I would say the age of the catalog, the consistency of earnings and the sources of earnings. So, you know, a catalog that's got a lot of, you know, uh, quarterly volatility is not going to be worth as much as one that is pretty consistent and um and the older it is the more valuable it will be yeah. what are what are some of the other biggest trends that you're seeing in your space too so streaming huge it's interesting by the way how that played out because you had like iHeartRadio, pandora you had all these platforms much we got a head start basically on spotify and spotify just came in and swallowed up everything the same yeah. with podcasting by the way yep Yep. Uh, and then also a uh, follow-up question on that is AI. What's the yep. impact of AI in music? Yeah. Okay. So the first part, um, I think streaming was sort of the, the vanguard of the digitization, digitalization of our lives. And um, independent of what you think about that, the, the thing about, um, people spending more and more time in digital spaces is that those spaces, one, need a soundtrack and two, if it's digital, it's trackable. If it's trackable, it's monetizable. Right. And so, so as like, like when we were starting, TikTok wasn't a thing. TikTok is a massive distribution platform for music that no one saw coming. And so, you know, if you're, if you're looking at, like you can imagine if you're buying a song, you're buying the streaming royalties and then you're buying, um, you know, how will this be used in the soundtrack for our increasingly digitized lives? Right. Um, because like the thing is, like when you buy the rights to a song, you don't buy like, I mean, in I guess in theory you could, but I would not recommend anyone do this, but like you could buy you know, um, the right to collect the Spotify income. But most of the time when you're buying royalties and all of the time when you're buying royalties on our site, you're buying a, like a copyright, right? An interest in a copyright, not usually not the whole copyright because there's a lot of different people that are participating in that, but you're buying this stream of income that's underpinned by the copyright. And so if you, you know, someone who bought like, and there's, we have a lot of examples of this, Someone who bought a song on our site in 2016, and then in 2021, it became like a TikTok meme song. The song just like blows up out of nowhere, and and like the person who bought that in 2016 is is the benefit gets gets more royalties from that, right? So um, so that is um, so that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question, the AI stuff. So um, this one is, is it's really interesting because I think there's certain types of music that this is going to affect more than others. So um, like the music that is sort of like background music for film and TV and background music for uh, commercials that it's not like an artist you've ever heard of everything else. Um, you know, it may affect that, right? Because if, if you need to have like, um, you know, 
uh, some chords on a guitar that make that sound sad. Like a computer can do that. It won't be as good, and it's not as good now as a, a human composer. But like I don't know, budget stuff like that for for a project, maybe that'll be the effect. What in terms of like artists, there's like a lot of people going after like um, the sort of the prize of like creating the first digital artist. And like none of them have worked. And um, there's this there's this thing and in, in, in the idea comes from robotics. It's like um, the uncanny valley, right? Which is this idea that something that is really close to a human, but not quite a human, we view that with like humans, like biologically. Um, view that with like a, a, a more distrust than like a obviously robotic avatar, like right? Um, and so whether or not like AI music can cross that uncanny valley and, and gain enough traction um, is still like, uh, you know, remains to be seen. And, and like the other thing that's kind of interesting, um, like <laughs> I remember hearing a pitch for a AI artist a few years ago. It's like, it's AI, it can't be canceled. And then like six months later, the AI artist got canceled, which is crazy, right? Like, just, just like, you know, and, um, and so I don't know, like, whatever you think about that entire thing and whether or not that sort of cancel culture is going to continue, it's a lot easier to just turn off an AI artist than it is to turn off a real artist. Um, what I, what I think will happen in terms of the music industry, though, is I think like a lot of things, I think AI tools will enable more music to be created. Um, I don't think there'll be like a replacement of that um, because it, you know, um, there's just something that is deeply human about the creation of music that I don't know that will be replaced anytime soon. Right. Um, but like, I can definitely see different AI tools. Like, if a producer is trying to decide like between 10 different beats or is trying to generate a hundred beats and just sit there and listen to what the computer did and then kind of modify it, stuff like that. Um, that, that is, that is a future I could, that's happening now. Right. The last thing I'm going to say on this, because I've, I've given you a bunch of different, like sort of like kind of in the waffly answers. Cause I, to be honest, I don't think anyone knows, right? And I think anyone that says they definitely know is full of shit. But the um, the last thing on it that I think is um, is out there, and I have no inside information on this at all. But the record labels and music publishers know, or at least strongly suspect that their music that they own the rights to has been used to train lots of AI models. And if the last 20 years of history is any guide, they will get very, very litigious. And so what may happen is like, and, and this is like, this seems very plausible to me, that a new royalty right will be created that is paid by the generative AI companies to everyone who owns music rights to use to train their model. And it'll be like an ongoing royalty. So it may be, it may be kind of a weird boon to people that own these rights because they may end up getting paid for people using that info to create generative AIs to make music. So super long winded answer, but it's hard no, to say. I, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. uh, music is part of the it, it. It's part of the human spirit, right? The human soul. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's always going to come from <laughs> from humans as much as they try. Is how I would look at it. it it's it's one of those things that it's part of who we are. Uh, yeah. It's how we share. You know, it's sitting around a fire and talking, uh, storytelling, and music, and yeah. sharing experiences is is part of the human experience. 
It is. It is. Yeah. Well, and I think too, um, that, I mean, that is fundamental. It could have an impact on music 20 years from now, because the other thing that is important to think about when you're, and this kind of comes back to the valuation piece, but like most people like stop listening to new music, like between the age of 27 and 35. Right. And, um, like there's a and and so like when you like um think about um if an artist was big when and you still listen to them and and like let's say you listen to them when you're 18 and um you know it's it's been a while since I was 18 and I still listen to a lot of the same artists that I listened to then and I'm not going to suddenly start listening to like random AI music because it's cheap and ubiquitous right um yeah. now for like my kids maybe they're going to be like super into ai or like music and all that kind of stuff um but like that that's but i'm not gonna i mean i'll listen to it enough so that i can talk to them about it and make sure it's not bad but like uh but but like i'm not gonna suddenly get really into whatever crazy stuff they're into Right? Yeah. And so there's this, like, you could look at sort of like the age of the population that likes a song and, and look at it. Okay. Well, it's got this many years left people listening to it yep. at the very least. So I don't know. Yeah. I have a lot of thoughts, but none of them are particularly like concrete on AI music. No, it's, it's, it's an interesting time we live in for sure. So, yeah. um, one of the things that we we talk about business, we talk about investing, we talk about cash flow yep. uh, and music royalties, but we also talk about uh, living and leaving a legacy. So I always ask my first time guests if they cannot pass on any money to future generations, um, if they could pass on three principles or values to them uh, to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Um, ooh, well, that's a good one. Okay. Um, I would say one, um, take, take your work or your mission seriously, but, but like totally don't take yourself seriously. Right. Um, two, I would say, uh, aggressively question everything you're told, except if it's me, except if it's me telling, you know, no, no, I'm kidding. But, um, but that and, and and sort of apply a critical uh, view on that which you're told and and especially question the things that you're not supposed to. And then the third is like uh, be um, hmm, three man. Uh, the third I'd say is like um, don't get caught up in in an identity that is um that isn't grounded in like fundamental moral principles yeah. awesome yeah. awesome where can folks follow you where can they send form of all the projects that you're involved in and where can they go uh to buy and sell music royalties uh royaltyexchange.com is the place to go I have no meaningful presence on the internet outside of that. So, uh, so that's, that's what I've been working on and, um, and what I will continue to do. So, um, uh, any of that's, that's, uh, it's a place to go. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're interested in, in buying music royalties, like come create an account on our site, we'd, we'd love to have you and, um, make sure to check out the ultimate guide to buying royalties and hopefully, uh, find it, you find it useful. Absolutely. And again, for our listeners uh, and viewers, uh, direct uh, directing to that page for that ultimate guide is cashroninja.com forward slash music royalties. This has been fantastic, Gary. Thank you so much uh -huh. for coming on the show and sharing your insights and your knowledge and providing so much value for all of my listeners and viewers. Uh, I hope they found it valuable. MC, it was a pleasure to, ha it was a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for doing this. Awesome. And thank you to you, the <laughs> listeners and the viewers for again, Spending your most valuable resource, your time with me on the show, Everything Cashflow Ninja, is at cashflowninja.com. 
podcasts, books, reports, webinars, and much, much more. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, The Wealth Dojo, the number one newsletter in the alternative wealth strategy and alternative asset investing space. You can subscribe to the weekly newsletter by going to cashflowninja.com forward slash subscribe. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place for customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.